Hey there, Lewis. Nice to nice to see you. Forgot I'd kind of set this group up to just automatically start and let people in. But that's good. Um, you're on mute. Hi, I said that I couldn't hear you because I didn't have the headphones. <laughs> One second. That's all right. Uh, <clears throat> nice to meet you, Finley. Yeah, <clears throat> you too. I was just saying I forgot I'd kind of set it up to let people in. Um, but that's all right. I'm just finishing my dinner, but um, <clears throat> and I think we'll I'll probably like leave it a little bit as well to let people join. Um, yeah, I I'm afraid that I think I will have to go also. Like I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to join the meeting because I have to put my kid to bed. <laughs> okay, that's all right. So, I, as as any might need to leave in two minutes. Exactly. If you okay. if because to sleep soon, I may be able to join a little bit later. I don't know how long you are planning on keep this running for. Mm. Otherwise, maybe we can catch up at some point. For one hour. Um, I will record it, but um, I'm happy to do happy to do this presentation again. You know, if you wanna, if you want me to do it with people at which university are you at again? What's Mister? Um, um, do you know there's uh, someone called Graham Smith? He's a professor at Westminster, and he's um, he's into citizens assemblies. Uh, no, no. Okay, it's worth looking up Graham Smith. Because um, he's one of the leading, um, I believe he's at Westminster, um, and he's one of the leading people. He's helped me think a bit about citizens' assemblies and how um, workers' assemblies could work. Okay. Good. Well, I'll let you do it, and hopefully I can join before the meeting finishes. That's okay, but no worries if not. I'll talk to you soon, yeah. All right. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Everyone, um, I'm just going to probably wait like five minutes um, for people to join. And I'm also just finishing my dinner, so I'm going to put myself on, on mute for a second.
Hey everybody, thanks for joining. Um, <clears throat> I was just leaving it a few minutes there um, to see if some extra people join. But yeah, I can make a start now. Um, just so you know, I'm going to record this session. Um, feel free to keep your cameras off or um, whatever. If you do have a question, feel free to answer it. Um, if you'd rather not be recorded, though, I can just remove that from recording quite easily. Um, so don't worry about kind of speaking up or adding questions. Um, the Yeah, I'm going to obviously talk through aviation worker assemblies, um, and I'll start just by kind of introducing safe landing as well and what we're about. So just doing that, um, we're a group, we're aviation workers for a sustainable future, um, campaigning for long-term job security in the aviation sector. We've got a website, safe-landing.org, and our email address is info at safelanding.org if you've got, got any questions as well following this presentation. <coughs> I do have a bit of a cough at the moment, so apologies in advance for coughing a lot during this. Okay, so just to cover what the demands of our group are, that these were a kind of, kind of set of four simple demands we agreed a couple of years ago. So we really want our industry leaders to firstly be honest about the total environmental impact of, fl of flying, not play it down, not disguise the non-CO2 effects, et cetera. Next, we want them to be realistic about the limits of technology to solve the environmental problem. Then we want them to be transparent about future regulations required to reduce emissions. And then finally, we want them to have a plan that accounts for that and supports workers during any transition. And we believe that a transition of the industry and a transformation of the industry is inevitable and needs to happen and, and workers need to be supported through that and ideally leading that as well to ensure that workers do come first. So <clears throat> why is the climate issue a jobs issue? Um, I think a lot of people don't necessarily connect these two things but I think it should be pretty obvious now that um, global warming is definitely happening. There's been a number of heat waves that have gone through the UK, through Europe, recently through China, through Africa, where there's um, there's famine. Um, we've seen Pakistan this year being devastated by intense flooding, about a third of the country going underwater. The prices of food, fuel and energy are rising rapidly. And this is because of our reliance, our societal and economic reliance on fossil fuels and the price volatility of those. Um, and because of this, we'll see unprecedented changes to how we travel, because travel is reliant on energy, it's energy intensive, and at the moment it's very reliant on fossil fuels. So that needs to change, and that will mean we change how we travel. So this is the greatest jobs issue of our generation, um, <clears throat> affecting transport sector workers. We have to be ready for this. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when, and I think that when is very soon, um, if not upon us already. So we really, we've got to be ready for that. So you might have seen that we put out a petition. Um, ICAO are currently meeting. They've got a general assembly that's happening right now, <coughs> lasting about a week. Um, we put out a petition last week proposing that they perform an aviation workers climate assembly. Now, the petition is there. <coughs> I'll, I'll send out this pack. Um, it's quite easy to copy that tiny URL, though. Please do, if you've not done that already, please sign it. And please also leave a comment letting us know why you've signed, because that just, like, it's much more interesting, but also it, it, it kind of gives a flavour for why different people are coming at this from different perspectives. And that's really important. So we've launched this campaign. Um, Last week, there's a, a kind of promo video. You can see Todd, he's a, he's a former pilot. Um, <clears throat> Todd and me are both in this video. It, and it's very much just trying to grab people's attention, um, but then direct them towards this concept of the industry changing and, and for that to be worker-led and the solution to that to be performing aviation workers assemblies. So you can find out more detail on the on our website 
Um, and obviously I'm going to take you through that just now. So I think in terms of kind of explaining why we think we need workers assemblies, it's firstly important to look at kind of the systemic issues facing the industry and facing um, policy topics and, and, and politics. <clears throat> So the first thing is that corporate and political leaders tend to avoid topics they see as risky um, in terms of their career. So climate is a classic example of this, um, but there's also plenty of other examples um, around. Um, and it's if, if there's if there's a topic that they feel could risk them being reelected or them staying in position, if they don't know what the public's attitude is on that, they're likely to try and avoid it. <coughs> The next thing is time horizons. So many leaders will remain in position for a few years. If we're looking at um, a prime minister or a president, their, their term is probably three, four years. Um, they might get reelected and then they might be in for five to 10 years at most. But that does not incentivize them to think long term. It incentivizes them to prioritize these short term quick wins um, over and above making difficult choices that will benefit the us in the long term. And also, for those of us that elect leaders, um, <coughs> and, and if we're um, working in a company, we've got a leader, it's difficult for us to have our voices heard and for us to influence those people in power. Um, often, you know, we've got a binary vote for a particular party, um, and that doesn't really make it clear where we stand on the vast array of like of issues and policies um, that that leader will be running on. Um, and this just means that often leaders just assume that people want what they think they want. And there isn't a back and forth dialogue. Often issues like action on climate are also really complex and complicated. And we aren't given the necessary information to allow us to make informed decisions. Part of this is because for example, climate is a complicated issue, but also just we're not really taught about this in schools. Um, some of it needs to be worked out still. Um, <coughs> there's a lot of science, there's a lot of te technical aspects to that. And you can't just expect the average person, the average citizen or the average worker to fully understand, you know, for example, in aviation, but th the limits of electric aircraft without taking them through that piece by piece. Um, in a structured way. So just to kind of illustrate what I'm saying here, if we've got a political or business leader, they're very much incentivized, literally the system set up for them to deliver quarterly profits um, <coughs> and to project growth of their country, of their industry um, in terms to boot in, in, in order to boost the share price and make them look good at what they're doing or boost GDP and make them look good in the short term. And then they're gonna be out the door in a few years. Uh, they'll take their money and they'll leave. And it's not their responsibility anymore what happens after them. The problem with this is the climate crisis where we will see more and more impacts of this over the next five to 10 years. And by that point, different people will be in charge and they'll be the ones that are left to pick up the consequences. So obviously, well, <coughs> well, citizens at large in terms of the climate crisis, we're all gonna, if we're still alive, we're gonna, we're gonna see those impacts. But aviation workers, they're also gonna see a transition of their industry. And if you're like me, like I'm sort of 30, I'm 32 years old, I want a career for another 30, 40 years, say, before I retire, it really matters to me what happens in the 2030s or the 2040s, I've got a stake in that. Our leaders don't have a stake and we need to recognize that issue of time horizon. So in order to kind of explain what a workers' assembly is, I think it's worth first introducing this kind of concept of citizens' assemblies. You've probably all heard of it, so I won't kind of stay on it too long, but there's been a variety of these already. Um, <clears throat> there's been a climate assembly in the UK, that's UK-wide, the one at the bottom, there's one in Scotland the year after, that was last year, again, looking at the, the, the issue of climate change, but with Scotland, Republic of Ireland, have also run a citizens assembly. They've ran one that was um, has been viewed as being really successful, looking at the topic of abortion, because that was because Republic of Ireland has kind of got quite a conservative Catholic 
history, um, politicians thought they couldn't touch that topic. But when they opened up to citizens' assemblies, they kind of found recommendations coming back to them that a large majority of the population um, basically were, were in favour of um, loosening the laws around what was possible with abortion. Um, and that then gave them the ability to, to go ahead and implement those policies. So that's seen as a bit of a success story. But in general, with a citizens' assembly, you get a group of people and they're brought together to learn about and discuss an issue, or it could be multiple issues, and reach conclusions about what they think should happen. The people that take part are chosen to reflect the wider population. So <coughs> demographics, so like age, gender, ethnicity, social class, if you're doing it for the UK, you probably have, expect 50-50-ish gender divide, you'd expect the, the range of ages um, and ethnicities, you know, let's just say when in the UK there was, um, you've got different um, minorities and, and one of them is 5%, you'd expect a 5% representation of that ethnic minority um, in the assembly and the same with social class. And also, sometimes relevant attitudes. So if you're doing a climate assembly, it's really important to rep have representative views of across the spectrum of, we need to take climate action, rapid climate action versus, I don't really care about it. I don't think it's a big problem um, and get a represented, representative views of the topic that you're discussing. So members, so citizens assemblies, this gives participants um, the time, the opportunity to learn about the topic um, participants hear from and they get to question a, a range of specialists and it's really important those specialists provide balanced evidence um, they're selected to give both sides of the debate um, and then the participants get a chance to discuss what they've heard deliberate with each other and decide what they think and sometimes that's in the form of voting um, often they last for kind of two or more weekends um, they tend to have at least 40 participants, they can have like up to 100. Um, and really importantly, there's independent facilitators there at all times to ensure that everyone's voice is heard and to facilitate it in a way that encourages deliberation effectively um, and, and produces good recommendations. So the conclusions of that the assembly are then written up and that's presented to decision makers. So in the case of a citizens assembly, the decision makers are politicians. In the case of a workers assembly, it could be trade unions or it could be business uh, corporate leaders and politicians as well. <clears throat> so the, the thing is though, there are a variety of issues with citizens assemblies. I'm just gonna check the chat. Uh, cool, that's fun. So, the first thing is that while this sounds like a great idea, and there has been, if you look at the climate assemblies in the UK and Scotland and France, they've all come up with recommendations that align with what climate scientists are saying are definitely required. For example, they're saying we need to fly less, we need to drive less, we need to buy less products, we need to eat less meat and reduce our meat consumption, change our diets, etc. The problem is, many of these recommendations have been ignored by the government. Um, and a central argument used by the government is they need to grow the economy and increase, increase employment. And there's this jobs narrative, which kind of counters like what's needed in terms of climate action. So there can be this kind of environment versus workers divide. For example, it's pretty obvious, if you're a livestock farmer, you'll feel threatened by the proposals to reduce meat eating justifiably you might be concerned that that might will be like an attack on your career and, and on your livelihood and you're concerned about that change <clears throat> and it's quite easy for politicians to um then whip up like an kind of anti-environmental sentiment amongst that sector and obviously i've said fly less there if you're an aviation worker and you see that you'd rightfully kind of intuitively be a bit concerned yeah and that's important to deal with <laughs> the other thing is that the recommendations made by the citizens' assemblies haven't made their way through that effectively, I don't think, into demands from environmental groups. <clears throat> so, um, for example, <clears throat> citizens' assemblies have all said we need to tax jet fuel, but <clears throat> I've never, <clears throat> sorry, I'm just taking a drink of water. 
I've never seen kind of anyone um, with a, a placard at a march that, that kind of reads out what the Citizens Assembly recommendations are. So <clears throat> I guess one kind of assessment of that is that the recommendations are too kind of complex, there's a lot of detail, and, and actually it's difficult for people to get kind of energized and feel like this affects them and that they want to push through on that fine detail that's in there. So this is where workers' assemblies come in. Yeah. So why workers' assemblies? Well, it might seem threatening when you see climate action and it's going to change your change your industry, but a major threat to job security is actually climate breakdown, which can lead to a major economic crash uh, and a rapid transition of the sector um, where a lot of jobs are lost. Um, and workers that are in fossil fuel reliant industries like aviation, like the automotive sector, like the energy sector are actually most at risk from an unplanned chaotic transition. Now, if those workers are given a voice, they can be agents of change rather than blockers of change. And they could actively ask government for, go for government policies to be implemented through early design, because this is inevitable, rather than late disaster, because we put our hands over our eyes, put our heads into the sand, and we've ignored it until it's too late. Workers are also directly affected by this, obviously. They understand the industry uh, better than anyone and can delve deeper into some of the industry specific questions and go further than citizens assemblies can. <clears throat> you could also, you know, if you look at the citizens assemblies on climate, they've looked at aviation, but only for an hour or two. Whereas you could do a worker assembly on aviation and, and really unpack a lot more things. Workers also have the ability to take direct action. They can take industrial action, they can go on strike um, within their industry and be another vehicle for change alongside a uh, citizen-led protest and direct action as well. So workers' assemblies, okay, that sounds good. So why aviation? Other than I work in the aviation sector and so do other people on this call, why not do an, a, another um, industry first? Because obviously you could do workers' assemblies in the, the energy sector, the transport sector, the road transport, rail, rail, we could do it for food, we could look at diet, we could look at agriculture and farming, we could look at buildings, industry, the list goes on. Um, we could also, I think there's some overarching questions around the question that would be set in these sectors. So is net zero by 2050 a good goal or do we need zero emissions by 2030? Um, how do we ensure equity? How do we uh, distribute resources? Um, <clears throat> and is 1.5 degrees, a valid target or do we kind of need to update that um etc so there's a lot of things we could go at and i think i would be an advocate for i think a workers assembly would be great for all of these things um but what why should we why do i think we should like flying and aviation is is a good place to start so the first thing is that um a lot of government bodies you've got the, com the climate change committee in the uk you've got the international panel on climate change internationally you've got the international energy agency the iea as well <coughs> they've all advocated for policies that encourage behavior change and limit air traffic growth um and as i say various citizens assemblies uk scotland france they've all done that as well but that has been completely ignored by governments and by the aviation industry. So there's a real disconnect between what the, the specialists, what the citizens assemblies are saying and what the government and the industry is doing. Next, um, it's, it's a high profile industry. Um, it's very visible, um, more visible than cement manufacturer or steel manufacturer, for example. And it's an interesting case study. It's 99.9% .9 reliant on fossil fuel because there's only a tiny fraction of sustainable alternative fuels and it has no near term technology solutions. So we need to think about what we need to do in terms of behavior change in the short term. And it's really important to involve workers and involve citizens in that. It has growth plans which completely contradict climate action. So um, <clears throat> I'll show you on a slide and it's coming up, but there's plans to kind of double air traffic growth um, in the next 15 years, not reduce it, like double it. Um, 
It's relatively unregulated with most emissions unaccounted for. I'm going to cover that as well. It's highly unequal, 1% of people producing 50% of emissions. So there's a large amount of injustice and equity that's involved here. It's also a relatively concentrated sector with a relatively small number of large companies and unions. So it could be easier to do a pilot or a trial than for example, the agricultural sector where there's a large number of companies, there's a lot of different types of agriculture, um, there's small private businesses, there's large ones as well. Um, it's kind of easier to scope than, than other sectors, I think. So just in terms of this emissions growth of aviation, this is the CO2, global CO2 emissions from aviation from, might be a bit difficult to read, but 1940 till 2020. So the past uh, 80 years. And it, it has been, the emissions have been massively increasing. Um, even in the past 10 years, you can see the finance, there, there's been the, the odd dip due to 9-11 uh, and then due to the financial crisis. But always we've, we've returned to this massive growth trajectory. Um, and that was particularly true ahead of COVID where we, we saw emissions grow five, four or 5% per year since 2010. Um, now, <coughs> Safe Landing believes this that the industry is on a very dangerous trajectory here and we need to set a new flight path. And I think I just wanted you to think of this increased rate of emissions going into the atmosphere, like opening up a tap where the water flowing out is CO2. And as you increase the rate, you're increasing the tap. What we're doing here is we are pouring CO2 into the atmosphere. You could visualize that like a bucket um, and we've been filling up that bucket. And when we fill the bucket to the brim, we've blown our carbon budget for 1.5 degrees C. Now, we've only got about 8% of the budget left, less than 10 years at current emissions levels. Um, so we really don't have time. It really matters what we do by 2030 here. It's no good looking at kind of things that might or might not happen in the 2040s. I thought this was quite an interesting chart. I saw this on Twitter this week. Um, James Hansen, who's a leading climate scientist, um, is predicting that we'll have an El Nino event. So El Nino is the cyclic temperature where it's particularly warm. We've not had one of those for quite a few years. Uh, and the prediction is we'll have one towards the end of 2023 into 2024 and we might well go above 1.4 degrees C of global warming within the next couple of years. So we're getting very close to 1.5 degrees C. I think we can't really underestimate just how little time we have here. Now the IPCC, they've said we need immediate and deep emissions reductions across all sectors. Um, and unless we do that, 1.5 degrees C is beyond reach. And I've just highlighted across all sectors here, aviation is definitely included in that. They've also highlighted reducing air travel as one of the main drivers for bringing down global emissions in terms of reduced demand. So this is something that scientists are identifying as absolutely key alongside other important measures as well. However, aviation, even if you look at kind of high, medium, low scenarios, even the low scenario, we're expecting more than a 2% growth per year in air traffic and that literally doubling um, by 2040. Now, the, what safe landing kind of sees here is <clears throat> we've had this kind of just to um, approximate this in a little cartoon, we've had historic growth of air traffic that's been almost exponential. We then had this crash due, due to COVID-19 and now the industry wants to return to this business as usual growth trajectory where we double air traffic in 15 years. What we're saying is we're really worried that there's going to be a climate crash because this is just a massive overcapacity um, compared to what's possible um, given the emissions from aviation and given the climate crisis. And there's going to be severe consequences in the next 10, 15 years where we decide, we realize that we really have to massively reduce fossil fuel really quickly and flying is one of the quickest ways you can just stop people flying and that will minimize CO2 emissions. That would cause a massive industry crash. It would be very dangerous for workers. And we then need to rebuild the sector from that point <coughs> with zero emissions aircraft, but from a very low base with a lot of workers suffering big time. What we're advocating for is a safer trajectory where we stay within the carbon budget, 
and we are careful about what we do in the near term so that we can as smoothly as possible go through this transition with in the, in the as smoothly and as well planned um, and, and as well designed as possible rather than something that is unplanned and chaotic and really dangerous for workers. However, <clears throat> this is kind of why, why we put this petition in place because ICAO, um, who are the international body responsible for aviation emissions, are the only ones that regulate international aviation emissions, where most of the emissions come from. Um, and at the moment, they've got something, the only policy that's in place is the CORSIA scheme, which is the Carbon Offsetting and Reduction Scheme for International Aviation. Now, there's a number of problems with this. Um, the first problem is the offset coverage. So the way the scheme works is it will only offset emissions from a 2019 baseline onwards, and it will only offset emissions growth past that point. So for the next few years, because of COVID, we're not even going to reach that level. And then in the years afterwards, we're only going to offset the emissions that go above that. So you can see the majority of emissions are not offset there. Most CO2 emissions aren't offset. And then if the ones that are, there's an incredibly cheap price per ton of CO2. Now, in if you look at carbon capture, carbon removal, that cost at the moment about $1,000 per ton. But Corsia, it could be like two, three dollars, and certainly less than ten dollars per ton, even in ten years' time, and that's just ridiculously cheap, particularly given it doesn't apply to most CO two emissions. The next problem is it doesn't include non CO two emissions. So the latest science shows that CO two is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of aviation emissions and global warming impact. You've got two thirds of aviation's total climate impact comes from the non CO two emissions, particularly the contrail cirrus. Um, that form behind aircraft. And this isn't addressed at all by the Corsia scheme. So it's a complete black hole of regulations. Um, so yeah, they're not accounted for at all in um, the UK or, or EU emissions trading system or the Corsia scheme. So just kind of kind of summary of that, the scheme is kind of far too weak. There's credits that are far too cheap and the credit system doesn't even apply to the vast majority of aircraft emissions. And this is what leads to basically these growth projections that say we're just going to keep on flying despite the impact because the impact is not being priced, it's not even being accounted for, and it's not being dealt with. And that's something that we think needs to change and we think workers need to think about how that's going to change and they need to push for that ourselves. Um, so, yeah. So why perform aviation workers assemblies? So we currently lack an independent worker-led vision of the future for aviation. <clears throat> Instead, um, many trade union policies just simply support industry sustainability roadmaps. Those are produced by business leaders and not by workers, just to kind of really hammer home the point here. Now, business leaders, as we're saying, they think in terms of quarterly profits, short-term tenures, whereas our members are thinking in, the ter in terms of decades. Um, now, if you think about it, when it comes to pay, terms and conditions, holiday, sick pay, um, when to start your job, um, we don't take the positions of our leaders at face value. Um, it's the job of <coughs> trade unions in particular to critically evaluate what our business leaders are saying, fight the corner of workers. And that kind of comes second nature to trade unions in most cases but not with sustainability plans. But the same thing applies to sustainability plans because these are the fundamental things that are going to define our industry going forward. And they're going to be the biggest jobs issue of our generation. So it's kind of really doesn't make sense that we would just give them a free pass and kind of stand entirely behind the plans of these leaders that don't have the same priorities when it comes to timescales and when it comes to long-term job security. So... <clears throat> As a citizens' assembly does, workers' assemblies would give workers the time, the space, the expert information to allow us to deliberate with our peers, with our colleagues, and produce informed policy recommendations. We draw on, as with a citizens' assembly, wide range of ages, genders, roles, ranks, like the time and position, types of jobs, um, you know, air traffic controllers, airline workers, pilots, cabin crew, 
engineers, airport workers, baggage handlers, et cetera, and, and political opinions. And that, that is the sortition process and it's well-defined. Members would be put at the heart of decision-making, um, particularly like trade union members, and that would be inevitably building on existing like strong union democratic traditions. If you go and look at trade unions, there's a lot of good social change that has come via trade unions. There is a democratic process, and this isn't about replacing that or indeed replacing political democratic processes, but it's about supercharging that um, and upgrading it and really like just making it stronger. It also raises the profile of worker democratic engagement. Yeah. Um, at the moment, when it comes to trade unionism, there's not really that many kind of younger workers that are engaged. There's a lot of older workers that are well unionized, but not younger ones. Whereas it's the younger workers that are most at stake here because they want to be in the job for, for the longest. And they most, lots of surveys show that they are most climate concerned as well and most interested in this. So this is a way of also exciting those workers, getting them in, um, and and getting them more involved as trade union activists. <clears throat> so there's a number of reasons why <coughs> this would be a kind of you know, it, it's in the kind of trade unions um, benefit to, to run this sort of thing. So that kind of puts us on to how do we scope these things? And this is kind of complicated, right? And we've had, been having a think about it in our group, um, and I think we've got a few different strands of how to approach this. But I very much appreciate everyone's opinions here on this as well. So there's kind of two possible strands. The first one is an aviation workers assembly that's industry wide and it's independent of companies and it's independent of unions. And then on the other side, doing a union specific um, climate forum that's, that's specific to a trade union and organized by, by the trade union, run by the trade union. And I think there's value in doing both of these things. Then when you look at <laughs> just working at the different elements to it. So Aviation Workers Assembly, industry-wide, you could still do it global um, as per our kind of ICAI petition. You could do a national one that just looks at kind of influencing national policy, for example, in the UK or the US or the EU. Um, or you could do a local one, particular to a region like the southwest of England, where I am, or to a specific factory even, because you want to think about Where's the, where's the future of aviation going? What sort of products do we want to manufacture in our factory? And do we want to be pushing our leaders to develop and to upscale the workers in our factory on? And I think all of these things have a benefit um, and, and I would make sense. <clears throat> when you look at union climate forums, you could obviously do <clears throat> a single trade union. So like British Airline Pilots Association Climate Forum or Unite the Union Climate Forum. Or you could do one that's got agreement from multiple trade unions. It is run by the unions, but it's run by a collection of them. So you can have Valpa, Unite, PCS, Prospect, all together, all supporting it um, and combining resources and pooling resources, because obviously British airline pilots just have pilots and that doesn't give you a wide range of perspectives. Okay, so then the next thing is kind of the location. So I've already, <laughs> I've already kind of mentioned this, but you could either do the world you could do uh, Europe, you could do the UK only, you could do a region within the UK. Um, one of them is wide scope, one of them is more narrow scope. The same with employment, you could look at all of the workers, even workers that are indirectly connected to, tour to aviation, such as tourism, or you could look at just direct workers, like just airlines, airports and engineers, or you could just look at pilots, or you could look at just pilots in a trade union and you've got an even narrower scope but you're more limited in terms of perspective. So on one, in one hand, the kind of blue stuff is a wider scope, greater stakeholder coverage, more perspectives, but would also be more complex and potentially more expensive. And then on the other hand, you've got narrower scope, smaller stakeholder coverage, but would be less complex and expensive and easier to run in the first instance to kind of prove this concept. Um, just in terms of that kind of direct versus indirect, um, I probably won't go through all of this, but <clears throat> there's various things that are, um, you know, you start getting into stuff like, okay, well, people that work at restaurants and in hotels and tourist destinations are impacted by this. Yes, they are. And obviously in an, in an ideal world, you'd kind of include all of these people, 
I think you, we, you, you need to select like a reasonable scope for this um, that makes sense. Otherwise you can start bringing in the entire world. Um, this was just a chart. If, you wanna, if you're wondering about direct um, employment, this is just showing that like, kind of 50% of people work in airports, um, about a, kind of 25% work in airlines um, and aircraft manufacturers similar airport operators and then air navigation um, like air traffic control and that you'd expect that kind of ratio of um, participants in a workers assembly so how would how would it work well just like a citizens assembly you'd have a period of learning from specialists then you'd have a deliberation process and then you'd have to decision making and voting on recommendations the input to that, you've got to select the participants and have a representative, representative mix of workers and an output, you'll have recommendations. And then those can feed into existing political democratic processes and existing union democratic processes. For example, policy motions to go through um, to the union, the national executive, et cetera. They can also inform union strategy and positions when it comes to lobbying and when it comes to pushing certain things in negotiations and industrial disputes. So just to kind of break down the assembly process here, you need to start off with participants, who will take part, what will the boundaries of the sortition process be? You then have to identify what's the problem, what's the question that's being asked and it's being answered. Then there's the process, what topics will be covered, which specialists will present info, where will it take place, how long will it be? Then you have the output, who will the recommendations be aimed at? What we expect is done with them and do we need advanced buy-in and support or do we just go ahead and do it <coughs> and then try and try and push the decision makers to then um, go good on the recommendations so just looking at the aviation workers assembly you've got this kind of question of global national or regional industry-wide direct or indirect only union members are all aviation workers <clears throat> you then get the problem the question that's being asked so we might ask you know, something quite expansive and all consuming, like how do we ensure an emissions pathway for aviation that's compliant with the Paris Agreement? That's a big question covering lots of topics. You could also look at where should public money be best spent? A real big topic here is should it be spent on sustainable aviation fuel or on aerospace technology? You might also be looking at what worker training and support is required through the changes that we're expecting to see. Then there's the process. So you've got a period of learning, maybe looking at the causes of the climate and ecological emergency, aviation's impact, the technology options, the policy options, and cross-sector needs. So, you know, like where we're saying we need biomass, where we're saying we need renewable energy, what's the shipping sector saying, what's the energy sector saying, how much is actually available, I think is a really crucial part of this. There'd then be a period of deliberation and voting before producing recommendations. And then in terms of who to aim it at, <coughs> Obviously, we could aim it at international level, at ICAO, at national level, if you did one in the UK, at the UK government, or the US, at the US government, and also at trade unions uh, and business leaders. Um, now, those recommendations could also be uh, inform a strategy for the site and trade union policy motions. Um, so that's me almost done, but I just kind of wanted to kind of leave it before we go on to kind of questions and discussion. Um, about kind of like where <clears throat> there's kind of been a couple of cases where like this kind of climate issue and what's going to happen with the future of aviation have like actually formed like really effective bits of trade union strategy. One of those is this site in Barnoldswick, that's in Northwest England. It produces fan blades for jet engines. And during COVID, Rolls-Royce, the company I work for, um, said that basically the site, which employed 350 workers, was going to be closed um, because there just wasn't the production need um, and they'd opened a new factory in Singapore and they were like actually we're just going to close this site. They all went on strike and they had a very effective um, strike action that lasted the best part of a year but it incorporated green demands so they not only did they say we need to save the site save the factory which is one of the main factories in the town in Barnoldswick and really supports all of the community there but they said you should keep this the site open and you should start training it training us and developing the manufacturing plant not to just make fan blades but to make zero carbon green technology now that was it wasn't exactly that well <coughs> defined 
but um, it then formed part of the agreement to keep the site open to also kind of have this training school um, and support the development and manufacture of zero carbon technologies. Now, that was a great demand and it kind of helped them secure that win. But also going forward, it's really important they get that choice of technology right so the site doesn't close again in five years if it, if it turns out that technology wasn't really that favorable and isn't really gonna make it and be used. Just also wanted to point out this so Doncaster Sheffield Airport closed and um, they just suddenly announced this. There's thousands of people that work there. Um, and I've actually contacted a few MPs um, and different union people that are related to that because I think thinking about what's gonna happen with that airport in the future, um, if it was to not close completely, but if it's gonna be redesigned and reconfigured, um, should all of the workers that are affected by this closure get together and kind of use a, an assembly process to work out what the future of that bit of infrastructure should be. Um, so yeah, so I'm just gonna leave it there. Because <coughs> um, yeah, probably taken up a lot of the time. Um, and yeah, just be keen on kind of everyone's thoughts. How many people have we got? We've got eight people. So we could probably just keep it rather than have breakout rooms. We could probably just have a discussion here. Um, if for those that have joined, um, I've been recording it. Um, but if you, um, if you, if you, if you, if you're worried about that and you still want to ask a question, go ahead. Don't be. I, and what I can do is I can I'll cut off the recording. Um, if if you let me know that you'd rather um, not have your video uploaded. So yeah. Um, is there is there any questions from anybody or has anybody got any thoughts? Yeah, please ra raise your hand. Like to hear has, and um, I'll kind of take it in order. Um, to hear, how you doing? Good to see you. All right, Finley. Uh, good, good to see you, and thanks for that presentation. I mean, really comprehensive and uh, really encouraging as well. Um, what I wanted to do actually is, is really express support for one particular. Well, I, I support the whole thing. Obviously, that goes without saying. But um, one one particular thing that you raised, which is whether we have those two strands on um, worker a worker assembly or and a union assembly, and I think you absolutely need to do two, both of those things. And there are specific reasons for that, which we're kind of going through in the trade union movement at the moment, which is um, I recognise that in just generally there's a bit of a schism really between those uh, unions or workers or activists that are those that are kind of retrenching in some of the more traditional uh, industries based on where we are at the moment in terms of political, social and economic uh, policies. Uh, but I think it actually breaks down really, and uh, slightly simplifying, breaks down to um, ordinary members and leaderships. Uh, that's not, it's not exactly that, but it's kind of broadly in those sort of terms, because I think most members of unions in a whole variety of sectors actually are quite open to the idea of the fact that um, we need to change. If we're going to change. We need to plan it now. We need some kind of transition that will protect their jobs in the long term. Um, there's been numerous studies in different areas. Um, one, one, I don't know if you're familiar with about North Sea oil workers, where you know really um, quite keen on seeing some sort of uh, development for the future. Because well, we've got, got Gavin on the call actually that was involved with that work. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but leaderships less so. I mean, it's not just GMB. Although we've seen some pretty horrendous um, statements coming out of GMB leadership and their motions, and that doesn't necessarily reflect the views of their members and, and you know it's it's yeah, we, we can see that in the general political scene i guess uh, uh, as well but um you know you you raised a really good point about politicians and say you know their their short termism but i think the same thing applies actually to trade union leaderships so what i'm getting around to in a long long-winded way is saying we need some kind of grassroots organization that brings together workers from across the entire aviation sector all the different uh disciplines that you mentioned earlier uh, coming together to build that pressure but you can't also need the union side because you can't just exclude that you have to win those people over to the debates um, and I must admit for me I'm coming to a kind of conclusion that you can't you can't I, I used to be very much for confronting those, those union leaderships with saying well look at what's going to happen in the future to your members the, the crash that you mentioned and showed in your graph um, 
but actually all you're doing is kind of putting yourself in a confrontational position there. So I think we have to kind of sideline that and say, instead, come to the table and talk about what might happen in the future, bearing in mind what the climate situation is likely to be. So just kind of live with their policy side and actually get them engaged. But essentially what I'm saying is you need both those strands and then you need them to interact. Uh, very much support that. And I think the structure of the whole assembly idea is a really good one. It would lead the way for other sectors to, to look at that and follow as well. So it won't take up any more time, but thank you for the great session. Yeah, yeah. Just, just to add, like we, we have talked to, so in, in terms of scoping this, I've been scoping it for a few months and I've talked to a variety of specialists and organisations that have run citizens' assemblies to get their input on. And that's kind of how we've done quite a thorough thinking around the process and stuff. But we have also talked to trade unions. So British Airline Pilots Association that I mentioned and also United the Union. I've been to a regional industrial sector conference in the Northwest and presented this and it was actually well received. Um, so, and, and that was from a room full of people that actually worked at Rolls-Royce and Safran and uh, BAE systems and shipbuilding. The shipbuilding was actually interested in it as well. Um, so I, I, it is some, and, and, and as well at Balpa, like it was well received and people from the National Exec Committee. Um, so some other, other people that are in safe landing presented that to them. Um, so yeah, I kind of agree with what you say on the grassroots and hopefully safe landing can be the vehicle for that, as you were saying, yeah. Um, Johnny, you've got your hand up. Yeah, hi. Um, just just on that on that last point, um, how can what 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 do you think um, should give us confidence that the demands of the workers' assembly will be taken up by the trade union leaders, for example, if there is resistance of those leaders to this in the same way that there's resistance in politicians to a lot of this, and then there's also the same kind of problem with short term leadership um i can I, you know i can i can see a a similar sort of thing going a similar problem there and also you know it, i don't know how i mean i'm sure there is a good segment of the membership of the trade unions which is behind the sort of thing that we're doing but you know i'm sure if the leaders are divided then also the membership perhaps is as well so do you think you know do you think there exists that pressure from the membership on on the leadership to actually you know, make sure that these changes get taken up if 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 they come out of this assembly. <laughs> so if you talk to the talking to the specialists on this, right? Because there's some people that have been thinking about citizens' assemblies a lot and kind of oh, the failure of <coughs> the failure of citizens' assembly recommendations to get much traction uh, politically. Now there has been some that have been more successful than others. Um, and when asked this question, um, it's been something we've debated, like kind of asked a lot of specialists and they've said, well, it all comes down to basically marketing and pressure is applied on people that are in power through the number of people that basically are aware the assembly is happening and are aware of the recommendations and a real failure of the UK Climate Assembly was very few people knew it was happening and very few people knew that it produced recommendations, even people in the climate movement really most people have never heard of it so of course politicians don't see any kind of pressure to implement the recommendations if um, no journalists are asking them questions about it no citizens are asking them about it in hustings etc um, so there really needs to be an integrated strategy that's thinking about marketing and advertising and promoting the assembly in the first place so people know it's happening they know it's really important and they and they know that they're interested about what the results are going to be. And then when the results come out, they're publicized in such a way that and that everyone's aware of it. So then at least if the recommendations are rejected, it's very, people know that that's happened. That's kind of fundamental. Um, it doesn't mean that they still can't do it, but they'll feel more pressure. So it all comes down to that. Now that you can't guarantee success there, but that, that kind of tells you, well, that's what you need to focus on here is that exact element um, there's no kind of guarantee of success it all comes down to how well organized you are and how well you do the comms on it basically sure. i do see but i do see a kind of benefit with workers assemblies which i identified which is workers do have that long-term vision the some of the, the union work union reps that i've been involved with aren't that old um 
and and they they do they really resonated with this challenging and critiquing business leaders because there's a real obvious lack of trust of business leaders um look at all the strikes that are happening right now and that's in trade unionist dna so that resonated with them challenging the business leaders and i think just anyone challenging these plans particularly aviation workers is really really important and would be useful in itself and then also that element of, of attracting young young people as well so <laughs> the thing is like we did present to the national exec people in balpa and they were quite keen on this so it, there we haven't actually had much resistance to it so far like it, it's been quite well received so there is promising signs there but I, I do think we'll just need to try it as well yeah, and see what yeah, happens. Yeah. um thanks so um no, thank, <laughs> thanks for the uh, the talk i was really um insightful so yeah thank you sure um, um sean I mean, yeah sorry that's yeah, right thank you i just wanted to kind of try to understand so if i i get if it's run by a, a union then the, well, if it's, oh, I suppose my question is, sorry, I've been very articulate here. If it's not run by a union, then who who is taking the lead? Effectively, who's paying for it? all this kind of marketing that we need to make sure it gets out there? Where does where does that come from? Um, and just ha how does that happen in the first place, I suppose? Who's, who's leading on it and ensuring that there's not the bias there as well? So, and, Second question, sort of related to that, is with with all the experts that are um, giving guidance to the workers' assemblies. Again, how do you ensure that you you have unbiased experts? So to take those points in turn, the first one is kind of uh, who who will pay for it and who will organise it. Um, so there has been, for example, the, the UK Citizens Assembly was supported by the UK government, but it wasn't actually funded by the UK government. It, <coughs> it required a bunch of environmental uh, think tank uh, funders to, to pay for it. So there's a European Climate Foundation, and I think is me fair, fair uh, maybe I have to look up on the website, but it actually wasn't paid for by the UK government because they weren't that keen on it. So um, yeah, I, I, something I would say is, I'm actually quite confident about getting funding for this because I've had chats to funders and they're quite interested if we can scope it well. I think if it was small scale, if, and it would have to be relatively big scale for that though. If it was just for a union for a particular site, then it would be more of a self-interest, self-contained thing and they'd probably need to fund it themselves. Um, if it was national or international, I think that would be harder to get a particular union to do it, but it would be easier to get funding for it and and then we'd have to look at like union buy-in to basically look at the recommendations and support the process um so or it could be a mixture of the two things um so i'm kind of wanting to take where we've taken it to unions do a union specific thing we haven't kind of said we help you find funding for it but if that was a blocker i'd then go and look for funding and said look they're supportive of it apart from the money thing and using that as a blocker and then i'd look kind of look for funding um but, but I have approached some funders and I have had positive noises from them about providing money for it. So that, that's kind of one thing. Um, your second question was about the selection of the specialists and experts. Um, that's just, that's quite a difficult thing. And, and it's kind of like one of the, <clears throat> not like limitations, but it's one of the challenges of the Citizens Assembly. And it's kind of addressed by basically on any topic, making sure there's more than one perspective. So if you look at hydrogen aircraft, you'd get in somebody from a hydrogen aircraft company, you'd also get in someone from an NGO and they kind of present both sides. Um, so it's not that the specialists are unbiased, it's just that you you recognize the bias and you get both sides. And then and then and then the citizens of the workers then decide kind of what they believe most. Um, what's important is that those specialists are selected by independent facilitators that are not involved with the process um, and they, they need to like fully lay out their justification for it and everything. So it's all about the transparency of the selection process, I think, um, rather than trying to look for someone who's like completely neutral in their view, which just doesn't exist. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's really helpful, thanks. Cool. Um, Johnny, have you got another? Yeah, just so would you, just a clarification on that then, would you, 
include the the union well whoever you want to pick up these proposals union leaders in the design of the um of the experiment if you like if so in the in terms of formulating the questions that are going to be asked um who's going to be on the panel giving the you know the specialists and you just mentioned so that they can't say you know we weren't involved in this and it was all biased sort of thing you know yeah so there's the, the people that are experienced at running this sort of thing um there is a little bit of a of an opinion divide over how much to involve the decision makers um one school of thought is to involve them quite closely and then they can see the whole process and they're more invested in it um, and they can see how well it's run and how balanced it is and everything <coughs> and they and they feel like part of the the recommendations they don't feel like it's an external body coming to them and telling them what to do that's all useful but then obviously the decision makers and two involved then they just provide all yeah, their biases yeah, yeah. and they help push it one way and then you basically just get them kind of dictating things um so there's another school of thought that's like you don't include them at all because that because of that um i think i think the important thing is it is so it, the very important thing is to have support from decision makers to that for the assembly to go ahead and a clear commitment to review the recommendations and to respond to them in full whether they decide to implement the recommendations in full for them to respond to them and provide a reason why they are or are not um going to implement it even better as has happened in poland they kind of say if there's a this particular one in Poland where like if there was a more than 80% consensus on an issue, they by default submitted it into parliament. Um, so there, but, but that, that kind of comes with a bit of kind of building up of trust as well. So yeah, I think that that's one aspect of it to be tweaked and to be thought about in more detail. Um, but yeah, I, in the first instance, it would be really good for, for if if the decision makers are fundamentally opposed to the assembly happening it's not gonna you're gonna be in for a fight when the recommendations come out they're gonna ignore them and you're gonna have to really put pressure on if you've got their prior agreement to the process in the first place and their agreement to look at stuff you can then hold them to that and then that conversation is going to be more friendly and collaborative which is what you should be aiming for now you then come to a decision if you, you try and do that and they're resistant then you've got a decision whether to go ahead anyway um, but I, I don't I don't think that's where you should start off from. I think you should start off from trying to in, involve them and win their support. Okay. <clears throat> um cool. Um any, anyone else, uh, Gavin or or Dayton, have you got any thoughts? <coughs> no worries if not. Cool. Um well I think we're at we're at half eight. Um so let, let's finish there, but um, okay, it's all been covered. Um, yeah, obviously you, you've got my email, um, mostly you've got my number and stuff if you want to discuss this further. Um, as I say, please share like the video and the petition with people as a starting point. The more, the more signatures we can get from that, um, the better. And I have kind of struggled with capacity the past week, just trying to like communicate it and, and, and get it to as many people as possible. Uh, Gavin, with Friends of the Earth, it'd be great if uh, you could send me someone or have a word with someone that might be able to share it on, on their network. That would be much appreciated. I did email you a few weeks about, ago about it and I've been able to get around to getting back to you and I've just, I've just struggled for time. So if you've got, um, I, I could send you an email just now and if you could um, set forward that to someone and, and have a word with them, that would be really appreciated. Yeah. Um, sure. Thanks so much. Um, yeah <laughs> cool so thanks very much for joining guys particularly on a thursday evening um hopefully that was informative and hopefully you're excited by this um and want to kind of be involved moving forward so if you would like to support this if, if you would like to be part of like scoping team we did have a whatsapp chat for this um it's kind of gone a bit dead the last month um but we're gonna i'm gonna kind of be revitalizing that so um if you want to be part of that or if you don't want to be part of that group but you'd like to be and stay informed um, let me know as well. Very keen for any support. Cool. Thanks a lot, guys.